Shit. Whoa. We're running late and I'm starting late and uh, half of you aren't here. But uh, we have a lot of announcements to get through today. I think what I'll do is I'll pile stuff up here on the corner and draw your attention to the fact that we've got these talks coming up and we have these very beautiful postcards for the Meta Center Open House that's taking place in two weeks. Yeah, come on up, Jordan. I have about three or four paper, uh, paper prospectuses, actually five or six, um, which I'll also leave here. So if you haven't gotten yours back yet, come up and get it at the end of the class. And to remind you, those papers are due the last class meeting, which I think is the 7th of May, okay, something like that. So there was some confusion. Some people thought that they were due on the final exam. And uh, unfortunately, that's not true. <laughs> uh, one announcement I'd like to make to everybody. Uh, Seishi, do you mind if – Seishi, do you mind if I tell people what you're writing on? Like I can do that? <laughs> I didn't give him much of a choice, did I? Uh, this is very heartwarming for me because uh, Seishi comes here from Togo, which is a country that has had a long-running dictatorship, one of the most longest and least pleasant dictatorships in Africa. And uh, when he left Africa to come here, he thought that the only way to dislodge it was through armed struggle. And now guess what? He's beginning to think that this stuff might make some sense. So I'm saying this might be the most important paper that you ever write and the most important one that we ever get in this class. And I have a resource for you. Next door to you, country of Benin, they're having some interesting experiments with democracy. And you have a long border with Benin. There's a little two long, thin countries. It might be easy to move some of that stuff over. So this is in the New Internationalist, which is a journal that I recommend anyway. I could, if I could get that back, Taco, when you're finished. Okay. Um, let's see. <coughs> First of all, I really liked our conversation on Tuesday, and I'd like to just take a minute and see if there's any follow-up. Any, anybody done any more thinking about the situation with the Sarayaku? We're going – that was a situation with a kind of momentary or situational resistance uh, that people hadn't prepared for. And as somebody pointed out – I remember it was roughly in this part of the room, but I don't remember who it was. Somebody pointed out there wasn't much continuity after this successful uh, resistance. They brought the soldiers in. They talked to them. They changed their minds around, gave them back their weapons and sent them back out. But by and large, there's not much that was structurally different. So by the time I'm finished today, I'm going to talk about and show you some material about a movement in a similar part of the world, working on a similar issue that constructed itself a little bit differently. But it's been going on for more than 20 years. Um, and that's the, that's the MST. But before we get there – and the part I'm not going to be able to cover, I'm afraid, is going through the readings that were in the reader. I had a few things I wanted to point out about that and maybe we'll get back to it next week. So and any follow-up from Tuesday's discussion other than issues that we touched upon that we've been <laughs> thinking about? <laughs> a, a dramatic introduction <laughs> for your question. <laughs> That will be your theme song. <laughs> if not, let me – and of course, you know, you could come back on later if it occurs to you. I wanted to respond to a few things that John Lindsay Poland brought up in his talk about FOR presence in Colombia. First of all, uh, I wanted to emphasize something that he almost wasn't going to mention except somebody asked him which is how many people constitute the Fellowship of Reconciliation Latin American Task Force presence in Colombia. And the astounding fact, as you remember, that it's five people. And uh, I feel in a way really good about this because this gives us a way to measure, if you will, the power of nonviolence. You remember from 
Tax 164A. I was fond of quoting that remark made by the last viceroy of India who said that when a city erupts in rioting, I have two choices. I can send a brigade of uh, you know, 10,000 heavily armed troops or one little brown man who doesn't even have any teeth. And they both have exactly the same effect uh, in, from his point of view, that is of quelling the violence. So do the math. Uh, one NV equals 10,000 V. <laughs> v equals one over – I don't know. You'll have to <laughs> take it from there. Uh, similarly, I mean we've done several of these comparative examples before. We stacked up the Indian freedom struggle against the Algerian one, all of which is starting to remind <coughs> me that I also had some other announcements ah. to – Mention one of them was about two resources that I'm going to send you by CourseWeb very soon, as soon as I get back to my office. In fact, one of them is a documentary film called Does Ter uh, No, sorry, neither of them is a documentary film. Cross that out. It's a study called Does Terrorism Work? Uh, two people who have stacked up a whole series of armed versus unarmed resistance movements which were comparable from one way or another. And who wants to take a quick guess at what the answer is? No. Very good, Catherine. Yeah. Uh, this is what they would call in Greece, Aki Day <laughs> so our no day. <laughs> no terrorism does not work compared to unarmed resistance. The other is a very interesting carryover from the – you remember when, when we studied the Utpur – uprising in Belgrade. I said this was unique from a, for a couple of points of view. One is this is the first time the United States government had supported a nonviolent anything, in this case a nonviolent insurrection. So that's an eye-opener. Maybe even more importantly, there's a direct flow-through of educational process in this movement. And that has been rare up until recently and this could make a tremendous difference. This could be a qualitative – quantum leap forward for nonviolence in the world where people found themselves in a struggle, didn't know exactly what to do. They went and found out. What a concept. You can go get some material translated and learn how to do it. Once they learned how to do it, they figured they could package that. Actually, they didn't do that themselves. That was the Institute – International Center for Nonviolent Conflict in Washington, D.C packaged this as a group called Canvas. And I found out from the second article I wanted to tell you about that <coughs> Canvas has a website which is Canvasopedia. <laughs> uh, and that's appropriate because pedia is actually from a Greek word paideia, meaning education. So that's appropriate for us. What, they are done, what they've done is first they packaged what they had learned there and started to take it to all the color revolutions in different parts of Europe. But now they're taking it all over the world and it's recently been applied in Papua New Guinea where there's a long-term struggle going on against Indonesian and against U.S. Um, interference of various kinds. I I can't imagine where that little yellow thing went with my other announcements, but I remember one announcement I wanted to make was that I might have to miss Tuesday's class, in which case I'll, I'll get it covered. But the point is that uh, there's, pro there's going to be probably during that period a, a, a showing, a premiere of a new documentary on Abdul Ghaffar Khan. And you know how the people of Los Angeles feel about film premieres. So I'm probably going to have to wear a tuxedo and be driven up in a sedan and with limo <laughs> and all the things, you know, <laughs> the lights. <laughs> uh, and if that's true, I will get it filmed and bring it back here and we'll spend the day watching it. But to seriously, if I do have to go down there, uh, I'll let you know by course web and I'll arrange for something else to happen. Okay. So uh, the other second – piece of reading I'm going to send you. It's rather long, I'm afraid, but it's, it's a detailed report of training that's been carried out by an organization called 
peace workers. I'm actually, for better or for worse, I'm the chairman of their board and we're having a meeting this afternoon. But they have been encouraging and systematically training the Papuan people to carry out their resistance, discovering that they had to resist. They had to carry out horizontal <laughs> nonviolence before they could carry out vertical nonviolence, which is roughly what we mean by constructive programs versus obstructive programs. They had to get their own act together before they could have a, an effective presence. Okay. So um, I can't at the moment remember why I was talking about that in this context, but I started to talk about things that I wanted to cite from John Lindsay Poland's talk, and one of them was that you have this – oh, yeah. I remember the connection now. You can put together these examples to show how incredibly more effective it is in terms of personnel, money, <coughs> and injury risk factors to do things by nonviolence than it is to do the same thing through violence. And I suppose by now we're pretty used to that idea, but it's really good to have some of these cases at our fingertips because most of the world still is not like us. After this webcast, of course, everything will be different. <laughs> and did I mention last week that – or Tuesday – that the webcast can now be gotten to directly through the medicine? Okay. Okay. So, yeah, five people making such a tremendous difference in Colombia at one point in Guatemala where you had one of the more dramatic results of nonviolent intervention. Uh, because it led to establishing a space where uh, opposition groups could function and that in turn led to a peace process. We're not saying that the peace process is still in effect and that Guatemala is a happy country right now, but at least it was, uh, it was given the chance by Peace Brigades International. And I think the most that peace PBI ever had there was probably six or eight people and at one point I know for a fact it was down to one guy who was able to do that. Another thing that John mentioned struck me very forcibly because uh, he said that he had gone to some of the people in this peace camp. Uh, I think <laughs> it was San Jose de Apartado, which is the best known one. And they said, we want you to come here but not to protect us. They said, we're going down. And we don't want to go down alone. We want somebody there to witness us. That struck me because when I met John Lindsay Poland was at a meeting in the early days of third party nonviolent intervention. We did not have nonviolent peace force, was not even a gleam in Mel Duncan and David Hartso's eyes at that point. We had a meeting in Santa Cruz. One of the people there was Mubarak Awad, who was a Palestinian, who started the Palestinian Center for the Study of Nonviolence. And we asked him, do you want us to come? We knew he was doing some very intense stuff. People were getting uh, killed. Do you want us to come and be with you? And he said, yes, we want you there. Don't tell us what to do. Just come, he said. We, we definitely want you there. We are not afraid to die, but we do not want to die alone. So th this just struck me on the emotional level. It, it some, that sometimes you – kind of stumble into the power of protective accompaniment and other dimensions of third-party nonviolent intervention. You go there just to be a moral witness for somebody, just to sort of hold their hand, if you will, uh, metaphorically. And you discover that your presence has a protective power. That's exactly how PBI got started in Nicaragua. They went down there to document the results of what was being called in those days low intensity conflict. That's one of those nice euphemisms for killing people slowly enough that it wouldn't get up over the radar. A uh, big deal. And uh, they went down there to document that. And they stayed in a village like Jalapa, which was almost on the border with Honduras, where the Contra were coming over all the time. Then when they got back to their comfortable homes in Marin, sitting around drinking their lattes, they realized that while they were in the village, nobody had been killed. And they came to the realization that they had to turn around and go back there. 
not for the purpose of documenting, which is sort of a formal way of saying witnessing, but for the purpose of protecting with their presence. And I've written about that in, uh, in Search for a Nonviolent Future. So we're at such an early stage with the awareness of nonviolence that people are stumbling upon it through serendipity. And we could accelerate things a lot by making more education available, which is what a lot of us in this class are, are already doing. Um, then um, he also touched on a, a topic that's useful for us to be aware of. You go to these remote villages. Remember he's talking about bouncing, bouncing on this jeep going up into the mountains for hours. Come to this village. The people in that village have zero opportunity to influence policy, even in Bogota, not to mention the United States. One of the things that third party interveners can be is a chain or big chain, sorry, a link in the chain of, of nonviolence. We've, we've mentioned this phrase before, the great chain of nonviolence. Often people on the ground who have no representation at the policy level can concatenate their way up there through a series of connections. So that remember we talked about Hildegard Gossmeyer having that function among others in the Philippines. So that's a very important thing that you can be by being down there is uh, you can carry the message up to the policy level. And it I've seen a film, I don't, I don't propose to show it to us, but one of the early films that PBI made shows PBI workers going into a village and talking to the Army personnel to introduce themselves, say, here's who we are, here's why we're here. But in the course of doing that, they immediately give the villagers and the others who are under threat connections to the, to the wider world. Um, Okay, then the one remaining thing, I think I'm forgetting one, so if I leap up and shut off the video and say, sorry guys, you'll uh, I'll, bring, I'll bring it up to you. But there's the one other, this is really sort of the main thing. You may remember that at one point, John said, Michael isn't going to like this. <laughs> and you might have wondered what that was about. It was one of these deep, bitter conflicts in the peace movement. Uh, no, it's not like that. Uh, what he was referring to is he was about to give you an explanation of how protective accompaniment works. And whenever I hear PBI people do it, and originally I, I knew him when he was in PBI. When I hear PBI doing this, I say, yes, but, and I add another dimension. So they've come to think that I don't actually like their explanation. It's not like that at all. I, hey, I mean, my sister was married to one of their explanations. Uh, <laughs> no, it's perfectly reasonable to treat people as, and I'm going to use the social science term for this, self-interest maximizers. You can treat people as though they were rational. No advertiser is fool enough to do anything like that. And no politician really is fool enough to do anything like that because they know that we have this very narrow surface of rationality and self-interest calculation. Underneath that, we have much deeper motives, which are both better and worse. You know, we have deeply selfish, vicious drives going on down there. That's why we all have to meditate and stuff. But we also have, and science is just beginning to discover this, we have these incredible selfless impulses that nobody knows how to tap into. Nobody has, knows how to sell us bubble gum on the basis of these things so they don't get advertised. But the example that's come back to my mind recently and I've been thinking about is after the tsunami that hit Southeast Asia in 2004, there was a Marine who was in there doing relief work. It was, it was dangerous and he was seeing a lot of horrible stuff. And he was interviewed at the end of the day, literally at the end of a very hard day of rescuing people and handing out food and stuff. And they asked him how he felt about what he was doing. He said, I have been serving my country. That's how you refer to military practice, okay, I'm not going to quarrel with that part. I've been serving my country for 30 years and I never got a day's fulfillment out of it until today. So John says that 
thinking, okay, these people, and uh, I'm partly plugging in details from other conversations I've had with him. The hit squad comes into uh, a, a town, a village. They've been told to, to get somebody. They knock on the door. They're ready to break in. The door opens. Uh-oh, there's a gringo standing there <laughs> or a gringa. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the jefe didn't tell them that this was going to happen. They don't know what to do. They don't have orders for that. So they go back. So that's sort of uh, just on the rational level, you see. Now the jefe who's sending out these hit squads, they come to know that what's happening is being observed. And like for example, even in Colombia where it doesn't seem like there's any – limit to the damage rule. Oh, that reminds me. Aha, I got it back. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Okay, we'll get there in a second. If I forget, just go like this because it has to do with the number 20. Okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, the people who are sending out these hit squads, they are comfortable operating in darkness undercover. You know, they just have their people drive up on a motorcycle, two people, one of them jumps off, bang, 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 back on the motorcycle, you disappear. That's all fine. But if somebody knows who you are and what you're doing, if this is witnessed, then you can really lose standing as a country that is uh, eligible for human rights on, on the basis of its human rights record for international funding. Right? So it, it is U.S. law that we cannot fund organizations like the paramilitaries in Colombia. There. That's not legal to do according to U.S. law, should anybody care to look at the legality of this. So we fund the government and the army and it takes about five minutes for the money to get over to the paramilitaries. But even that constitutes a kind of deterrence that if everybody knew that this was happening, the government might lose funding. I started uh, in my chapter in um, Search for a Nonviolent Future with this episode about Karen Ridd, how she was picked up along with four others. And it turned out that um, El Salvador had trade agreements with Canada. Karen Ridd is a Canadian. Canadian government gets on the phone and says, you have one of our people. Give her back or we have no trade agreement anymore. So all of this is true and it is happening and I don't deny it and it's not true that, quote, Michael doesn't like it. It's just that Michael isn't satisfied with it. Michael is a hard person to satisfy. Michael wants to say that even in these – I'm trying not to use a four-letter word – even in these people who have been so dehumanized that they can jump off the back of a motor scooter and shoot you ten times and drive away without thinking about it, even in such a person, there is a conscience. If there were not, we would not be really in business in this course. So I'm saying that while all of this rational calculation is going on, under the surface there is also a human response that's going on. And the dynamic of that is very simple. If you have a target, a person has become a target in your mind, you're going to do something to that person. There's another person there. Suddenly it's not just a duality anymore. This introduces a disturbing element. And if that third person is there risking their life to protect the person that you had been about to kill, it awakens your humane awareness that that was a fellow human being there. Now, I am willing to go this far with uh, the self-interest maximizers of the world. This doesn't always, quote, work. You are not always in a position to reach people enough to waken them up so that they won't pull the trigger. But it will always do work, right? It will always affect things and change it for the better. So all I'm saying is why don't we acknowledge both of these levels of human motivation and build on them. So now, Mike, did you want to ask something before I get to my remaining point? Yeah. Well, uh, sometimes, uh, for example, when this – probably the most notorious massacre took place at Akteal in Chiapas, people – or John actually also mentioned a case where paramilitaries were attacking somebody 
and there was an army helicopter circling overhead. Now, if you, if you come out, you observe that helicopter, you write down the number and you simply call it in on your cell phone to headquarters in Bogota. They release it to the press or what have you. So it goes. It's not that there's a lot of accountability where they catch the people who have actually done the murders. If you make the mistake of victimizing a North American person, then like those five nuns in uh, El Salvador, then you might get in trouble. Zoe, okay, yeah, okay, good. Okay, so now my one remaining thing. This is so satisfying, can't tell you. Uh, I heard a talk, and so did John and Lindsay Poland. Actually, we were at the same event with the late lamented Senator Paul Wellstone, who had spent some time in Colombia, had a lot of interesting stories to tell. One of the things he told us was that they had done a study of how much money it would take to persuade a Colombian peasant not to grow coca. And it turned out that if you gave the peasants dollars not to grow coca, it cost one-twentieth of what it cost to eradicate the coca after he or she had grown it. So we could be getting 20 times more non-bang <laughs> for the buck and not be doing those horrible things to the ecosystem that John was talking about, which is futile anyway because as he was saying, they just move over to another field and plant it. And there's horrible cases of what these chemicals have done to plants, animals, and people. And th even the economy of it doesn't make sense. We could be, be 20 times more effective if we would go in and just give the peasants a subsidy. But of course, you never, never do that. Never give an indigenous person a break. That's uh, the name of the game. Paolo? You get that, um, yeah, you know, the fact is that Senator Wellstone is no longer with us. I don't know how we could track that down, but I do think that uh, John Lindsay Poland might know it because those two went on and had a deep conversation after that. Yeah, so you could ask him. He's in a FOR office in Oakland. Hmm? Well, yeah, yeah. Well, I don't think that if you gave them the money, they wouldn't grow coca, but they wouldn't grow it as an export cash monocrop. That's all we're saying. They, right now, they're depending on it to get above subsistence. That's all. Matt. Okay. Well, I guess there would be two things that I would want to say about the situation in Colombia. As Matt is pointing out, the government is, uh, for one reason or another, usually both, is incapacitated. It's not able to stop, step in and intercept the drug trade and everything goes on from there. I think for the first time I'm beginning to notice that voices are being raised much more publicly in Colombia, in Mexico, saying, you, you cannot fix the problem here. You've got to get Americans to stop wanting cocaine, which to me means you have to give them a purpose for living, which is a place where we will never go. The two things you will never – three things you will never, never do. Never give an indigenous person any money, never report on a nonviolent episode, and never ask what is the purpose of life. <laughs> Those are the absolutely foundation pillars of our – culture.com. <laughs> but that's, that's where it would have to be stopped and then you wouldn't 
you wouldn't need the government. You know, there's this, there's this demand side economics. As for extradition and punishment, this again, a, as we were saying in connection with restorative justice, it's not the most effective way of going about stopping any behavior. Uh, a former chair of peace and conflict studies who had also been the uh, Supreme Court Justice of California, that was in our great glorious days of tax, I had come up with a scheme in terms of international law. He said, okay, you can have your law court in The Hague. I mean, everybody likes to go to The Hague because it's a very pretty place. Let's have it there, but if you really want to be effective, what you should do is economic sanctions. Which is <laughs> so you don't get into the business of Nuremberg ambiguities where you're accusing people of doing things that you yourself have been doing and all the rest of it. Don't, don't make it an abstract justice issue. Just say, if you wage war on a country, you're going to have to pay such heavy reparations that it will not have been worth it for you. And that will be more effective in ending the behavior than trying to capture and criminalize the people afterwards. So again, I'm not saying that the international court of law doesn't have a function and I, you know, I wish Mlado Radic were there instead of hanging out somewhere in a villa in, in the hills of Montenegro or wherever he's hiding. But uh, where is he? South America by now? Oh boy. <laughs> we'll never get him back. Uh, I'm not saying that th there isn't a certain amount of uh, deterrent effect through justice operations, but it's not nearly as effective as going further down the causal chain. Right. Zoe. What's I got? I th I'm not actually an expert in <laughs> in this subject. Um, I think it's either <coughs> from or coming through Colombia. I think I think so. I think so. I th yeah. And we haven't even started to talk yet about certain government agencies that are actually importing stuff. You go to the Ella Baker Center, they'll tell you all about that. But I don't even want to go there, <laughs> although I just did. <laughs> okay. So should we uh, we're gonna move on? We want to talk now about uh, the Movimento de Trabajadores Sempera. Uh, MST, Movement of Landless Workers. They were actually given their name, Semteras, by someone who was opposed to them, a uh, military commander in, in a particular uh, region. Uh, the background is this, uh, that when this thing started, you, you, you all are very aware that Brazil is one hell of a big country. It's got this extremely long river going through it. And it's culturally, I think, almost as mixed as Colombia. Probably as mixed as you have um, African population and mixed African. And of course, you have these indigenous people who are still living way in the upper reaches of the Amazon. Okay, when this thing got started, 60% of the farmland in Brazil was idle. Okay. 25 million people had no land. These were the Sem Terras. 5% of the people owned 90% of the wealth. Some of the farms, a technical – the term in um, Portuguese is latifundio. Is that how you pronounce it, Tom? Latifundio, which from the Latin latifundium. <laughs> I can't tell you anything about – contemporary world, but <laughs> I can get you back there. Uh, there were some land holdings in Brazil in the early 80s, the period that we're starting with, which were larger than Belgium. Yeah. One person would have a farm. I mean, you think it's bad in Texas. <laughs> you, know, you know, they'll joke about, well, you, you all come down and come down and see my spread sometime. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, my spread's so big, if I get in my truck and <laughs> I'll stop the accent here. <laughs> drive, drive around all day. It takes me all day to drive around my ranch. And then the, 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 per the other person says, yeah, my truck is like that too. 
But uh, if you think we have unequal <laughs> land holding problems in this country, just imagine a country of 25 million people on the edge of destitution living in these uh, favelas which have been considered probably the lowest grade human habitations on the planet. I remember a colleague of mine, Professor Sternberg from the Geography Department, going down to back, – back home, he was from Brazil – going down there one time with an entomologist who was studying ants, A-N-T-S. <laughs> and the guy came back and said, you know, the ants spend more time on their ho housing than the people do. <laughs> they had, they're doing better with it. I also have some nice stories to tell you about favelas, but we're, we're running out of time here. So here you have on the one hand, 25 million people on the edge of destitution. They have no access to wealth really of any kind because it's a, such an agricultural economy. And on the other hand, 5 percent of the people owning uh, all this land, 60 percent of which is idle. So there was a uh, stipulation. Um, a statement in the Brazilian Constitution which states that if you are not working your land for a certain period of time and someone else comes in and starts to make productive use of that land, they can apply to the government for title. The period – okay. The peri if it's been idle for 10 years? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. So you have this set up in the Constitution, and it makes perfectly good sense. And it's like, you know, we were just talking about the sorrows of government, Matt. You know, so you can you can make it into a law, but that doesn't mean that people are going to carry it out. And of course, nobody had dared uh, really try this. Um, but this is a movement which got started almost within the Catholic Church, just as the Mondragon movement did in the Basque region. We started with one priest, Father Arismendi. Here also there were some people who started talking to the peasants and they got this idea which is, you know, it's, this is not rocket science. Okay, we need land. They don't have any. They have land. They don't need it. Duh, dot, dot, dot. <laughs> Let's, let's just go and occupy it and plant on it and see what happens. So this happened in um, Rio Grande do Sul and um, an, an encampment that was called Encrucilada Natalino. Encrucilada Natalino. Encrucilada Natalino. <laughs> I'm going to have to leave the Portuguese to, to you, Paolo. Okay, <laughs> we, we got a deal. Uh, Encrucilada, I know it means the crossroads, right? So it, it's, like, uh, it's like our famous crossroads in the Philippines, in Manila, uh, Ed Ed Edsa. Uh, and they uh, occupied the land and um, it, it seemed to work out pretty well. I'm mean, just kind of going quickly so that officially – in 1984, landless rural workers – it was sort of their name – had a meeting in a town called Cascavel in the state of Paraná, which I believe is in the south. Good. And the following year, the MST officially organized itself at the national level, which is a huge undertaking. And they had a meeting called the First National Congress of the Landless. In a little while – we're going to see some images of how these people actually operated. You'll see them having meetings. You'll see them going into a territory and occupying it. But this is basically how the um, resistance, if you want to call it that, works. Do note, this is perfectly legal. Uh, the resistance is not going to come directly from the government. It's going to come from uh, – are we okay? That's not a, what I'm thinking, is it? No. <laughs> no. Incidentally, <laughs> I read a very interesting study on earthquakes. And uh, it said 
forget everything that you were told in school. Don't, don't get under a desk because when the ceiling lands on the desk, you will be flatso. <laughs> but what will happen is next to when it lands, you know, like this, it'll go like that and it'll create what's called the triangle of life. <laughs> This is, for, this is for real, and I feel it's my responsibility to tell you this. So if it is an earthquake and we can't get out of the building in time, get down next to your chair, okay, or next to your desk. Okay, never say you did not learn anything in Pax <laughs> 164b. Okay. So here, here's the basic situation. It is legal. You are applying the law, and of course the resistance is going to come as it does all over South America from landowners and people whom they hire. So you see this very, very clearly in Venezuela and many other places as well. And in, in a way, that's, t that's worse than being against the state because the state, you know, you can change the laws. You can hold them accountable. These people are operating in the dark. They cannot be held accountable. That's why you create a paramilitary because you know, the military is too visible. Um, and as these people began to occupy land and uh, they began to realize that this could become a, a movement of social significance that would go way beyond just getting a livelihood for some destitute people. Uh, they began to understand, for one thing, that winning the land, even when you did succeed at doing this – and I'm going to give you some of the statistics later, very soon actually – even when you succeeded at doing this, it wasn't enough because you get the people living there on the land, but they also needed credit because you needed to buy tools, you need to buy seeds and so forth. You needed housing, technical assistance, schools, and health care, all of these things, none of which would be supplied by the state. So you were going to start building these things yourself. And what are we going to call this? Parallel institutions. Excellent. Yeah. This is a very important subset of constructive programs. So what we're seeing is that this lack is being turned to advantage, and turned to a great advantage. Because while you're going and building a school, what are you going to teach there? What kind of school is this? You're not going to say, well, let's teach people enough calculus so that they can go to Rio and set up shop as neoliberal economists. That's not what you're going to do in these little schools. You know, it reminds you of this famous uh, thing that Peter Kropotkin, the old uh, anarchist, used to say, decide what kind of a world you want to live in, decide what kind of skills you need to build that world, get your teachers to teach you that, which I assume is where I, why all of you are here. So what's happening is, uh, to the long and the short of it is, that they're creating a whole culture there, a whole new paradigm culture with a new kind of decision making, which at this point in time is extremely slow and clumsy. I can tell you that because I've been trying to get them to translate my book and do some nonviolence training for a long time, and they say. We're thinking about it, but we're working on it by consensus. This has been going on for years. So sorry, that's just my personal little grievance with this whole business. You don't have to worry about that. But this is an incredible opportunity. It's like World War II wiped out the infrastructure of Japanese and German industry as a result of which they have the strongest economies in the world because you get to start over again. In an even deeper way, here are people who are building the kind of world that we want to have with democratic decision-making, uh, relevant but not superficial, not uh, employment-oriented education, and they're building communities of a kind. I mean, this is amazing. Gandhi had communities in place. All he had to do was bring them back to life, bring them back online. But here were people who were just living randomly in encampments or in slums and favelas. And you had them actually starting communities. So you can imagine, on the one hand, how difficult, but on the other hand, how exhilarating this is. And they, s they discovered in course of time, in other words, that what they were going against is not just one landholder here or one latifundio here, but they are going against the whole neoliberal 
model. Um, w they had, they are uh, doing things to eliminate fields of GMOs, genetically modified organisms. They carry out marcher, marches, hunger strikes, and other political actions. Uh, in April of 1997, marked a year after 19 workers had been massacred in the state of Pará. And I am – I guess I should tell you right away that at least 1,000 people have been killed in the course of this movement by police, paramilitaries, shadowy <laughs> henchmen, whatever. So they had this march in April of 97, uh, which brought people – this for the first time what it did was it collected people from all over Brazil. We're still talking mostly about southern Brazil where this has been most active. There it goes again. I think we've decided that's not an earthquake, right? It's just a, uh, a bad pulley on some lever somewhere. I don't know. If anybody goes under the desk, I'm going to be the second one down there. So <laughs> 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 anyway. uh, given the state of the equipment in this building, I think it's much more likely that it's a faulty fan belt than, a, than an earthquake. Um, so this – for the first time, people participated in a concerted mass movement that involved landless workers from all over the country. And so it's taken about 10 years to get to that point. Today – this is about one year ago, this report that I'm reading – today the MST is active in 23 out of 27 states in Brazil. It involves more than 1.5 million people that they involve in the sense that these people are members of the MST. About 350,000 families have been settled on their own land through this struggle. So this makes it probably the largest social movement <coughs> of anything resembling its kind, as far as I know, anywhere in the world, and certainly in Brazil. 350,000 families have, uh, are settled awaiting uh, – have already gotten land title from the government. And another 80,000 families as of this time were living in encampments awaiting government recognition. This is a process that obviously can go on for a couple of years. But see, this is really a contrast to the Sarayaku struggle that we were talking about on Tuesday. This is huge. This, this really is bidding fair to rebuild – well, it's doing what we always say that we have to do in this great struggle of ours, which is to create a new world in the shell of the old. You know, haven't you heard that expression? We've got to build a new culture, a new economy in the shell of the older economy. We go against the older economy where we absolutely have to, but basically we ignore them and do our own thing when we can. The hope being that it'll kind of be like a, a snake sloughing its old skin and we'll have a new world and everybody will be happy. There'll be no more earthquakes and so on and so forth. Hmm? So if you look at the numbers, it's really pretty impressive. Uh, there are 400 associations in areas of production, commercialization – that means taking food crops and selling them – and various services, 49 agricultural and cattle raising cooperatives. This is exactly what Gandhi was trying to do in India. And now that I think of it, that might be – the only really comparable example that we've had of widespread from the ground roots up rebuilding of a society and a culture in the shell of an older system. Um, they generate employment, income, and revenue that indirectly benefit about 700 small towns in Brazil's interior. Now the education thing is huge. 160,000 children are now enrolled in classes from the first to the fourth grade in 1,800 public schools and MST settlements, all being done totally under the official radar. You know, the t 
teachers are trained, certified, set out entirely without government assistance, unquote. The th uh, 1,800 schools, 1,800 schools, 3,900 educators, mostly paid by the towns nearby, th who have developed a pedagogy specifically suited for rural MST schools. Very decentralized. It's super. You know, I'm just uh, really loving this. On the other hand, UNESCO has come into the picture and they've gotten involved and there's, there is involvement in more than 50 universities in Brazil. In fact, I have uh, an instructor from one of those universities is taking the meditation course. Uh, do you know Renato Fajaldo? Uh, Renato? Yeah. Yeah, they have studied the MST in the university and it's a mutually beneficial situation where they're able to give technical assistance to the MST people. And they're also able to study this movement, which is springing up spontaneously. And the MST has developed a literacy program for approximately 19,000 adults and teenagers in the settlements. So I want to give you a sense of, you know, the scale of the thing that we are, are dealing with. Um, another dimension. MST families tend to be conscious of the need to preserve the natural environment and human health. Seems to go along with living on the land and using it for food production. You develop a certain respect for it as opposed, for, as opposed to going through monocropping, sweeping everything off into trucks and selling it at uh, Andronicos <laughs> up in Berkeley. So in September of 1999, they uh, started a uh, project called BioNature Seeds and they produce seeds without pesticides, herbicides or other chemicals. Big deal. They have taken action to preserve forests in certain areas and to produce herbal medicines. Uh, here we are in the public health building. You are probably aware that this field of um, ag uh, eco pharmacology, that's not the, how they call it. <laughs> it's, there's some technical name for it now. I'm usually, I'm usually good at technical names, but a technical name for indigenous medicinal properties. I forget what it's called. Ethnobotany. Thank you. Thanks, Josiah. Yeah. I should have thought you would have been the guy to do that. Yeah, Ethnobot ethnobotanists, and if there are any of you here in the room, you know who you are. <laughs> ethnobotanists have calculated that we have discovered maybe 1% of the curative properties of species of plants in the Panamanian, Ecuadorian, Brazilian jungles. So they're working on that also. Still another dimension. The MST has eventually come to recognize that even though they're a big movement in Brazil, Brazil is not the world and there are similar movements going on all over the world. Wherever they have expressed solidarity with all oppressed people living in poverty and they have an organization called Via Campesina, you know, the rural way. Via, V-I-A. And this, uh, this group went – get this now, this is, this is really neat. They spent three weeks with Yasser Arafat in, in his uh, mountain redoubt <laughs> in, in his uh, – in, uh, Beth in I guess that was Bethlehem where he was, uh, where he was surrounded there uh, during the month of April, I think, of 2000. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to show solidarity with him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From the language, I might you might think it started in Mexico. Yeah. 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 Right. Will bring the most farmers 
Okay. Yeah, I had actually said that slightly wrong. It wasn't the MST that started the Via Campesina, but they have participated yeah. that w in, in, for example, this delegation to Arafat. Right. It's yeah, big. it's very big, very big and qualitatively it's different because uh, I guess we've said this a time or two, but it's a very big fact we ought to keep in mind that the big drawback for most indigenous people has been their isolation and that has limited their effectiveness. And this is the first time in world history where they're beginning to come in contact with one another, and that could become an unstoppable force. One yeah. One last thing. Yeah. Also, um, it's interesting. It, it's also very active in the United States because uh -huh. you saw these things that the United States is not affected with this, but I mean, in the region, mm -hmm. but a lot of small scale farmers in yeah. the U.S. So it, it's a huge number, something like yeah. a thousand a day or something that yeah. go out of business. That's right. And it, the number has grown with them that from 1945. Yeah. Five yeah, yeah, and it was hitting rock bottom except for people in this kind of self-conscious attempt to recreate it. And you have people like, um, oh, that f famous writer who is also a farmer, uh, Wendell Berry. Wendell Berry he has his farm in in Tennessee, where he, you know, he's a world-class poet and uh, novelist and critic. But he and his wife still work a farm where his great grandfather lived. So we have people doing this, going back and reinvesting these ways, which are probably is the only way that it's going to be made to work. So this is this is all extremely encouraging and very sort of new and interesting. Um, uh, in Brazil. Landless MST families had activities to show their solidarity with the Palestinian community, called for an end to Israeli attacks, and was able to send 100 soccer balls produced by MST members to Palestinian children. <laughs> I, hope, I hope they were signed by some of those really, really good Santos players <laughs> before they got over there. Uh, in addition to Via Campesina, MST is part of CLOC, which translates to the Latin American Coordination of Rural Workers Organizations, which started in 1992. It is fighting for agrarian reform, of course, for free, sovereign, and egalitarian Brazil. I haven't even mentioned that yet. And for a continent – this is another thing we haven't mentioned yet – a continent free from the fair trade agreement of the Americas. So very much in solidarity with our Costa Rican mujeres who came here a while ago. I want to tell you about one – well, maybe two episodes and then we'll see some images of this. Um, this is a May 1st of I, – gosh, I'm going to have to check, but I think we're talking about 1999. No, 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 much more recent. This is after Lula was in power. There was a 10-year or much the longer, 15 or 20-year military dictatorship in Brazil. It was one of the worst Be until, uh, until 80, 80 – oh, yeah, okay. I was born but not in Brazil. So <laughs> between the two of us, we're a complete washout. But <laughs> sometime in the early 80s and it was when that, when that was over, that was when the MST really got started because they thought now that we've got somebody to talk to. And of course when uh, Lula da Silva was elected, it looked like things were really going to be sweet. There were a lot of people who think the way Matt does, that governments are going to solve the problem. <laughs> and uh, I'm only teasing you, Matt. I know you, you're not, you don't think that. May 1st um, of I think 2005, 13,000 landless workers set off on a 200-kilometer march to the federal capital, Brasilia, to demand that Lula implement his own rather limited agrarian reform plan. All they wanted him to do was to carry out what he got elected to do and said he would do, rather than the disastrous project that on um, servicing the national debt for the benefit of the uh, WTO and the Bretton Woods institutions. When they got there to Brasilia, they decided to go to the U.S. Ambient Embassy – I wonder how they picked that out – and the Brazilian Finance Ministry instead of targeting, quote-unquote, 
the government and, and Lula. But they sent a delegation of 50 people who went and had a warm three-hour meeting with him. At one point in this meeting, he did something which was to set off a, s a media storm. He put on an MST cap. This shocked everybody, either for better or for worse, to see the president of Brazil wearing a, M a landless worker cap. Uh, he agreed – he committed himself to settling 430,000 families by the end of 2006. Four four hundred and thirty thousand, four hundred and thirty thousand. But unfortunately, while this very cordial meeting was going on with fifty people, the peaceful demonstrators were set upon by mounted police, charged into them, swinging batons, and at the end of the melee, fifty people were wounded. That includes both sides. Okay, so. I'm – yeah, R.B. Yes, this is what I was hoping that you would pick up on. Exactly. Yeah, this is the point. So because – I'm not sure how long this, uh, this segment will take that we're about to start. Thank you very much, John. There's one point that I want you to get out of it, which I, I better just tell you because this might go by quickly. What we have here – is um, probably the most developed constructive program operation in the world in terms of any nonviolent movement. It's, we've talked about all the areas that it's reached into and it, how it all grew up organically. They discovered they needed this uh, to take care of the land. They discovered that their problems were much deeper than just one landowner but it goes all right to the heart of neoliberal economies. So it grew up naturally. It's, you just could not ask for a better constructive program. It was, it was doing perfectly. But in terms of knowing how to deal with conflict through nonviolence – John? <laughs> okay, we're not going to – we won't start there. So if we don't get there, I will uh, tell you about it next time. Okay. I get, where are we going to start from? Okay, let's start from the beginning and then do some fast forwarding and see if we can. Okay. I thought that was something we had to see. We'll discuss this a little bit more next week. I hope and expect I'll see you on Tuesday. If not, I'll be letting you know. <laughs>